So uh, I'd like you to sit back, relax, strap it down, and we're going to uh, hit a lot of geek stuff. So first thing to know about Media Composer 6, obviously you've heard the buzzword that it is 64-bit. Uh, that's a big buzzword, and I find that a lot of people aren't really quite sure what that means, so let's go over that just briefly so we're on the same page. 64-bit allows for a lot of different things uh, with software. First off, it allows the, the software to send larger data sets to the system to be processed. That means uh, fewer large trips as opposed to many little trips, which means data is crunched through faster. So right off the bat, you are getting a little bit of speed bump with that. Uh, second of all, we have the, uh, uh, the ability to access more memory. And the ability to access more memory, obviously, allows the system to write data to RAM rather than hard drive. RAM is easier to access than a hard drive, thus things go faster. So that's uh, a couple reasons why 64-bit is fantastic. But why in the Sam Hill should you care? Well, reason being with 64-bit is that with, when Media Composer does this, you now have instant accessibility or near instant accessibility for nested sequences and effects. So uh, that, that allows Media Composer to operate a hell of a lot faster. Um, this is a screen grab from a PC that I ran uh, a few days ago, and you can see this machine is, um, is a trusty XW8600, and you'll see that I've used easily over 5 gig with just a basic sequence, and you'll see that during playback, I'm going across all cores. So not only has uh, Avid made Media Composer uh, available to run in a 64-bit space, ported it over, but also has streamlined some of the playback. One of the things I want to make sure everyone understands, however, is just like here where we see a cowboy hat, there's a lot beneath the surface. Avid has only scratched the surface with porting Media Composer over to 64-bit. Just because it runs under 64-bit doesn't mean it completely take advantage of 64-bit. So I want everyone to be aware that this is going to be a work in progress, that um, the abilities are there, we just aren't completely there yet. I also want you guys to know that uh, Media Composer 6 eats up a lot of memory. Uh, the system that I'm running on today is actually a mid-2010 MacBook Pro, and um, I find Media Composer right now, as you'll see in a few minutes, is already eating up uh, almost 3.5 gigs of RAM, uh, Media Composer and the OS. So just be aware, this is a, a pretty monster application. One of the other big things is obviously the sexy, sleek new interface, or at least as sexy as an interface can be. Um, one thing Avid has done, which I think is a tip of the hat to, to Apple actually, is they've kept all your muscle memory intact. Meaning, if you're used to a keystroke, if you're used to clicking at this point in the interface to uh, enable your function, that is retained. I truly believe that Avid didn't want to fall prey to the Final Cut 10 debacle where everyone got alienated. Um, I think Avid's always been very loyal um, to the editors who made them what they are today, and I think because of that, they've been very careful to not change that and to keep people who are used to Media Composer keep things at least somewhat the same. So why don't we actually take a look at the interface. So I'm actually going to bounce over to Media Composer. And what you'll notice is that um, I'm running Avid Symphony. Those of you who are familiar with the, um, uh, the Media Composer product line, uh, or the Avid product line, pardon me, know that there are only a few differences between Symphony and Media Composer. So what I'm showing you today um, is uh, not anything that is unique to Symphony. So don't be razzled, don't be frazzled that I'm showing you Symphony. Everything that I'm showing you can be done in Media Composer. So one of the first things we have is something that I've always liked in Premiere, uh, which is the concept of tabbed bins. Uh, those of you who are power editors may be accustomed to using two monitors, and one you may call affectionately your palette monitor or your bin monitor, and that's where you have all of your bins. And in a documentary, that can be a real pain because you just have 30 bins open, which also slows down the machine. You'll notice up here, and I'll zoom in so you can see, we have several different tabs here. That's because each of these are bins. I can certainly click on one of these and detach it, and it becomes its own bin as you're accustomed to. Uh, I can also, again, take this and dock it back, which makes organization a heck of a lot easier. You'll also notice that I have a little disclosure triangle here, which allows me to cycle in between uh, each of the tabs, or excuse me, bins as well. We still have our basic ways of viewing things in the bin. 
uh, excuse me, we still have our text view, our frame view, and script view. So those of you who are accustomed to that, you're, you're set with that. Uh, you'll notice that our color scheme is a little bit different as well. Um, this can be changed uh, relatively easily uh, in my settings. If I go to my interface, you'll see that I get a slider here where I can adjust everything from my Knight Rider kind of dark look, which personally I think gives me a headache, or I can go up to my I'm blind and I need to turn things up all the way, my light setting. So you have all these options to customize this to make it as sexy and or as sleek as you'd like. I personally prefer, prefer it to be around 75, 80%. Now, because things are streamlined a little bit in terms of looks and everything is, is kind of the same uh, color, just different shades, it can sometimes be difficult to differentiate between the different bins. Well, I can certainly go up to my bin, click in the bin, and under the edit menu, go to set bin background, and I can certainly change that. And now this changes um, the, uh, the background of the bin, which again makes it easier to track down out of the corner of your eye um, and then use. You'll also notice that we have these colorful uh, buttons up here at the top for your close, minimize, and maximize. Uh, the jury's still out on this. I'm not sure if I really dig this or not. It does make it pop. It does make the bin stick out when I go in between windows. Um, it just seems a little out of place to me. Um, but, you know, your mileage may vary. Uh, each of us have our own preferences. You'll also notice that uh, AMA, those of you who have jumped on the AMA bandwagon starting in Media Composer 3.5, uh, and now through QuickTime in version 5.5, um, you may notice that you, you typically have yellow bars uh, over your AMA files. And while it made it easy to track down AMA media, it got to be a little bit annoying um, or an eyesore. Avid's changed that, and you'll see if I zoom in here, the icon is now a traditional film strip, but then we have a little chain icon there, as in AMA linking. So um, a slight change, uh, nothing huge. Again, like I said, Media Composer is, uh, or Avid is making sure that they don't radically change things, but uh, make sure that uh, um, what you're accustomed to stays the same. And you'll notice a couple other GUI changes. You'll notice that the time code window up top is a little bit different. I'm not going to harp on that. I just wanted to go over some of, the, some of the basics there. Let's go back to our presentation. Next, we have OpenIO, and from what I've heard from Avid, this has probably been the most oft-requested uh, feature within Media Composer for years. Um, as you know, Media Composer, excuse me, Avid has always had their own hardware, um, which has enabled them to have really good QC in terms of video in and out, uh, and the proverbial one throat to choke, which I'm a huge fan of. If something goes wrong with your hardware or software, there's only one phone number to call. Um, well key code or calling Avid. Um, now that we're opening up to third-party I.O., it changes the game a little bit. Not only does it allow to have more uh, cooks in the kitchen, so to speak, but it also allows for a lower price point. And so I'm going to go over some of the most popular I.O. devices and what my thoughts on them are. Uh, I should mention that um, anything that I mentioned during this webinar, I, uh, we're not receiving any kind of financial compensation for. So what you're getting, like Mike Cavanaugh said, is my skeptic, pure, unadulterated uh, opinions on this. First, let's jump to AJA. Uh, anyone that knows me who has been to any of my seminars or webinars, I am a huge AJA fan. I cannot speak highly enough about the company. Uh, I'm a fan of any company that offers a great product, uh, but I'll also support. And um, I don't think there is a company that is even second to AJA in terms of uh, uh, support. Um, their engineers, when you call, their engineers actually understand workflow. It's not a case of, well, does the light turn on? Yes, okay, then something's, then something's wrong with your system, not ours. I much prefer AJA, uh, despite the fact, as you can see at the bottom, there is a, a price difference. Um, if you were to look at, let's say, a Black Magic card, which can start at $200, um, the AJA devices can start at about $1,000. So there is a price difference, but uh, I'm a huge fan of the support issue that comes with it, plus the warranty. That being said, uh, some of the devices that the AJA, uh, that AJA has, obviously the legendary Kona 3 family, uh, the Kona 3, the Kona 3G are supported, uh, the Kona LHI and the new Kona LHE Plus, those are all supported, uh, both in Mac and PC. Those of you who use PC for years may be familiar with the Xena card. Uh, the Xena and Kona are now the same, it's just a software difference. 
Uh, the upcoming IOXT, those of you who followed the NAB blogs may have seen that the IOXT uh, was announced. It's a Thunderbolt IO device. Looks a, lo a little bit like the IO Express. I believe that just started shipping, uh, and I've heard nothing but good things about it thus far. I personally haven't tested it. But um, my, my thought is that if you want to start doing video I.O. Um, on your system with Avid. Um, if you have the money, I recommend going with a Kona LHI or LHE Plus and then maybe upgrading in the future to a Kona 3. Next we have Blackmagic and Blackmagic has really made a name for itself lately. Um, I mean it was a larger company before but lately they've purchased um, uh, Resolve by DaVinci. Uh, you may have noticed yesterday in the news they purchased Terranex which is a, a, a very interesting acquisition. Um, but they make a lot of um, less expensive video I.O. Their DeckLink family for example starts at uh, $199 which is very inexpensive. Um, I find Blackmagic cards very common in um, people who are just starting video editing, who, who aren't sure how much, they're, how much of their foot they're going to dip into the pool, uh, and it's a good stepping stone. Uh, Blackmagic has also released just a plethora of devices, both PCIe, USB 3.0, and Thunderbolt. So pretty much any I.O. you need uh, and any connection you need, they have. Um, in order to get this to work with Avid, you'll need Desktop Video 9, which is a, a free download uh, from Blackmagic. Next we have Bluefish, and I'm not sure a lot of a lot of people out there who have heard of Bluefish who aren't playing in the Hollywood market. Uh, Bluefish is a uber high-end video I/O card. Uh, I don't know if you can see via the webinar, but if you look at that card at the at the center there at the left, you'll notice that there's a lot of processing being done on the card. There's a lot of chips. That's because the difference between a lot of video I.O. cards is the amount of processing that's done on board. Uh, less expensive cards can rely on the computer more, can rely on the graphics card more, and do less processing on the card. After all, less hardware on the card is a lesser price point. Um, Bluefish has decided, you know what, we're just going to put everything hardware-based on the card and make it 12-bit. So if you're looking for the highest quality possible, um, Bluefish, by, by uh, far and away, has some of the best I.O. you're going to find in terms of quality. Uh, of course, that also comes at a price premium. You'll see that the basic starting point, and, and again, this is subject to change, is about $2,200. Uh, at last check, I believe the PC just came out of public beta, and I believe the Mac driver is coming soon uh, for Media Composer. Next we have Motu. Uh, those of you who are old school audio guys like myself may remember Mark of the Unicorn back in the day doing IO and, uh, audio I.O. and synchronization devices. Uh, several years ago they jumped into the video I.O. realm and they released the HDX SDI and the HD, uh, excuse me, HD Express. The HD Express, as the name implies, is more of a portable device which connects to an Express card in your laptop, whereas the HDX SDI uh, is more of a um, facility grade device, kind of like the Nitrous DX that Avid would have. Um, I haven't heard anything bad about them. I have to plead a little bit of ignorance, unfortunately. I have uh, heard about the device for years, and, and we heard that um, it was going to be an AJA killer or a Black Magic killer. And unfortunately, I just have not seen the traction um, that uh, we thought it may have. So uh, I'd recommend if you want to keep the tires on it, track down a reseller like Keycode Media, and we can certainly give you a hand. Next we have Matrox. Um, Avid kind of a, uh, adopted Matrox or vice versa uh, a little while ago um, with the last version of Media Composer software um, to allow for the MXO2 Mini to play with Media Composer for output only. And this gave uh, users a really easy way to do video output via HD uh, on the road. But it also was good enough to feed your HD monitor in your edit bay. So it became a really powerful uh, device. Those of you who have used Final Cut um, know that the MX02 family has been around for several years and has been immensely popular in that realm. Um, uh, they also have just recently released the Mojito uh, card, which is a PCIe card, kind of like the deck links or the um, Kona cards. But it has an H.264 uh, acceleration on the card. Um, I have not been able to test it. It was just announced, um, but uh, it's supposed to enhance the H.264, uh, I believe, during export. I don't think, and I could be wrong here, it accelerates H.264 playback. Um, a lot of people have been very happy with the uh, Matrox Max and the H.264 accelerator. Uh, I have heard some complaints that uh, there aren't enough options 
on the export for H.264, and since so many facilities and so many outlets want H.264, they need the ability of adjusting a ton of parameters. Um, so I think there needs to be a little bit more work on that. So that concludes basically open I.O. Um, as I mentioned, I'm a big fan of uh, companies who are doing open I.O., uh, who subscribe to open I.O., to have support, support and good products, and, and I think that AJA is probably the only company that has all three of those um, down pat. It should be noted that any kind of open I.O. that you want to use, um, Avid has written an SDK for developers. Um, they only have to get the SDK from Avid, and then they write their drivers to correspond to that. So when you start getting errors with I.O., that's when you have to consider, well, do I need to contact Blackmagic or AJA or Matrox and not Avid because there's that software layer, which I'll get into a little bit later, um, on how the two connect to one another. You should also be aware that just like when AMA came out, there are a few hiccups. Uh, OpenIO, uh, via many of these cards, don't support um, LTC. Uh, ancillary data track may not come through. Uh, some frame rates may not go through. So uh, really scour the Avid website or give me a call, and I'll be more than happy to talk you through what will and what won't work. So we still have the Avid hardware, and I think a lot of people were concerned that with this new open I.O. that Avid hardware will be dead. And for a personal note, I, I, I think we may be half right. Um, I think the, uh, the main hardware, which is the Avid Nitrous DX, I don't think there's any even close replacement for this. Just like the Meridian box, just like the Adrenaline box, this is the flagship box that offers almost every kind of I.O. in and every kind of I.O. out. There isn't a box right now out there that does that. Uh, via a third party and allows for the following features. Um, contrary to popular belief, there is DNX HD acceleration within uh, the Nitrous DX. So if you're playing back or capturing a DNX HD stream, this box is going to enhance that so your computer doesn't have to be as powerful. Uh, there's an expansion port inside, the, actually two expansion ports inside the Nitrous DX, which allow you to put um, expansion cards in there. One allows for another stream of DNX HD, which allows for capture of full res stereoscopic uh, ingest as well as output. You can also put an AVCI accelerator card in there, which will allow you to uh, play back and capture AVC intra, which we're finding more and more in the uh, professional broadcast realm. And it just has a lot of friggin' I.O. So uh, I don't think that the Nitrous DX is going anywhere anytime soon. Its architecture is sound. It's expandable. So I, I think this is still a really good box. And with the massive price drop with Media Composer 6, uh, I think it warrants uh, being considered. We also have the Mojo DX, the kind of little brother to Nitrous DX. Uh, the Mojo DX is really good, uh, good for facility grade, where people are routing everything through SDI or maybe only using SDI monitors and decks. Um, it allows for HD SDI in and out, plus HDMI out, and then analog and optical audio. Um, I don't see a lot of these. Um, I don't see a lot of these being sold or used because there is no hardware acceleration being done in the box. Um, and now with third-party I.O., the only thing that we're getting with the Mojo DX is stuff that will probably be supported with third-party I.O. Uh, soon, we hope. You know, the, like I mentioned, the LTC and the ancillary uh, data track, as well as some of the oddball frame rates. Um, those are not supported right now via third-party, but uh, they are supported via the Mojo DX. So um, just, I guess, be cautious if you're looking to jump into this, because we're not seeing a lot of these being sold, and I really don't see how long it will be for this world. Uh, given the fact that we have all these third-party options. Again, just my opinion. So let's jump back into the interface a little bit. I don't want to bore you with uh, Prezi slides, uh, but I want to make sure that you have all the information to scribble down. So let's jump back into Media Composer. And we're going to go through the Capture tool. Under Tools, if I go to Capture, you'll see that the tool looks relatively familiar. We have our standard capture our record button, our trash button, but you'll also see a couple different windows that are kind of hidden. If I click this disclosure triangle here, you'll see that I have some 3D functionality here. You see that I have uh, master clip type, as well as essence type and type layout. I'm actually going to close this. I'm going to go to my format tab, which allows me to change my stereoscopic method. And I'm going to put this to side by side, just so you can see how the Capture tool changes. So back under Tool, if I go to Capture, you'll see that uh, under my master clip type, I now have the option of choosing stereo or mono, meaning do I want to capture two eyes or one eye. My essence type, whether I'm capturing full discrete eyes, full RAS or full res, 
or am I doing two eyes compressed into one HD frame size, over or under or side by side? And then what is my tape layout? Am I capturing from multiple tapes or uh, multiple tapes or a single tape? Those of you who are using SR decks may be familiar with the practice of archiving each eye full res to an SR tape. You'll also notice that uh, uh, down in the video capture portion, I can select VLR, which is video left and right. So if I'm capturing stereo or mono, you'll see that changes then to just video. You'll see that I have my audio track selected. And as something we'll get into later, we have our audio selection. If I uh, click the disclosure triangle under audio and I select my audio format, whether it be surround SMPTE, surround film, or surround uh, uh, Pro Tools, once I select this, you'll see that automatically the six audio tracks get selected out. That's because Surround 5.1 has six tracks, and Avid is automatically relegating these tracks to the Surround. Under Video, I have my, of course, fire, my trusty FireWire, but I also have Matrox. Now, when I select Matrox, you'll see that um, I have an option up here for gear. If, and this gear probably looks new to you. If I click it, it automatically launches the control panel for uh, the device. So if you're launching, let's say, the AJA, if you have an AJA card, that's going to launch your AGA control panel. I have a Matrox MX02 Mini attached, so it pops up my system preferences configuration pane. So this allows you to go in here and actually change all of your video I.O. settings without having to worry about exiting out of the program. Um, this one thing to know is that if you use Final Cut, you know that there are several ways to skin a cat and several ways to kill the cat. Um, when you're dealing with video I.O., Avid is talking to the software which controls the I.O. device. That means that you need to not only configure the software which controls the I.O. device, but also configure Avid. This means there are several steps in the process. Again, those of you who have used Final Cut in these cards know that you, have, you had to go into your system preferences or, or control panel and save, um, or save the frame buffer and save the input, and then go into Final Cut and change your input capture settings. There are two different places to do it. So be aware that while you can change your I.O. settings in Avid, you do have to change it within your control panel as well. As I scroll down, you'll see that I also have leading eye, a leading eye window, which again is for a leading eye option, which is again for stereoscopic, what, lie, what eye is going to be leading. Traditionally, it's left, and where I'm going to pull my time code from. Traditionally, stereo files should have left and right uh, locked, but sometimes they don't. Uh, under resolution, we have not only your flavor du jour, DNX HD, but we also have our ProRes. This is brand new. We now have the ability within Avid to capture into ProRes. So that chocolatey goodness codec that you're accustomed to in Final Cut, that 10-bit codec, you now can use within Media Composer um, uh, to, to capture your footage. It also gets you the best of both worlds. It not only uses the ProRes codec, but also wraps it into an MXF wrapper. So you get the codec that you like from Final Cut or Apple, but you also get the metadata management or organization of um, Media Composer. Now, in all honesty, uh, the, uh, I think the jury's still out on here. Uh, those of you who are low-level uh, user geeks, um, I don't know um, if Media Composer operates better with ProRes as a codec as opposed to DNX HD. Um, I do know that Avid is hard coded to use DNX HD better than any other codec, and I uh, have yet to have a drunken conversation with uh, any engineers at Avid to determine um, at what depth Avid plays with ProRes at this point. Um, but uh, for all accounts that I've heard from the users, performance is pretty good. You'll notice that there is not a ProRes 422, excuse me, ProRes 4444. Uh, there, there is no 4444 codec enabled in Avid right now with an alpha channel. Uh, I don't know whether that's coming, but for right now, uh, that there is no 4444 codec. Let's jump back into our trusty slob deck. Avid Marketplace. Uh, Avid Marketplace, uh, a new feature in Avid, allows you to actually go in and buy or rent video plugins or audio plugins and buy stock footage. Those of you who have done documentaries uh, or needed to pull stuff from stock libraries know that it's been a tedious process of getting a DVD of the clip and then ripping it into Media Composer and then making sure that you uh, it looks decent enough to match and then getting that code number back to the stock house and having that generated for you or, or dealing with high-res downloads it can just be a pain. In Media Composer, and I'll close the capture tool, 
there is a new heading called Marketplace, oddly named. And under Marketplace, I'm going to select Media Libraries. This pulls up a browser within Media Composer that allows me to search for footage and download it. All you have to do is create a free account. As you can say, I've created an account with the odd name of Michael Thomas, just so I can search. And in here, I'm going to try and stick with our Western theme, and I'm going to type in Western. Now, as it searches, I'm going to get a plethora of results. In those results, on the left-hand side, I'm going to have the option of further filtering those results uh, to different resolutions, whether it be 16.9, whether it be, uh, uh, we'll select that now, whether it be my frame rate. Maybe I want to select something that's only native to my current frame rate, which is uh, uh, 23.98. So I'll select 1080p, that's good enough for me, and uh, I'll download a clip. Before I download it, I actually have the option um, of looking at a clip. In fact, here's a cowboy right here. I can click on this, and it's going to launch one of two players, either a simple player or an advanced player. The one that pops up now is my advanced player, because that's what I had open uh, last. And you'll see that I will have play, rewind, fast forward, mark in, mark out options, so it makes the clip that I'm downloading just what I need. You'll also see that I can go full screen if need be. On the right-hand side, you'll see all the aspects about that clip, meaning the frame rate, the frame size, and then how it can be physically delivered, uh, whether it's on tape or DVD, as well as how it's stored online. So I know that it's stored at 422HQ online. So if I want to work with this, all I have to do is click Downloads download Comp. I select my bin, and on the bottom left-hand side, you'll see my download. And this clip downloads directly to my bin. So if I now go back into Media Composer and uh, we'll close Marketplace, and I now go to that clip, there's my clip. Let me change this back to non-stereo mono, and you'll see there's my clip. Excellent. I can use it like I would any other clip. So I can certainly start a, uh, here's another sequence that I've had, and I can just drop this clip in. There's my clip. Now, for billing purposes, obviously the almighty dollar, how am I getting paid for using this? How am I billing for this? A couple different ways. I can right-click in the Composer window and uh, do a stock footage report. And that stock footage report will save a text file anywhere you'd like and uh, will, allow you to, uh, will allow you to open that up and then give that to whoever the producer is, whoever's paying for it, uh, so you can then bill against that. If that's not a big deal and you're not running into that, you also have the option, and there we go, there's our nice report. I also have the option of just buying it. I can right click on the clip and say buy stock footage. That will relaunch my uh, marketplace window. And by scrolling down, I can see what kind of project type, what am I using it for, uh, what my territory is, uh, what delivery format I need, and the price will be calculated. Um, you'll then be able to download the full res if you want it and keep working. So that makes uh, the stock footage realm a lot easier to use. Uh, as I mentioned, we also have the option of uh, renting audio and video plugins, as well as buying support and other products. So I believe Avid is still flushing this out. Um, so be patient while new stuff is added. But it does make things a heck of a lot easier. So the often maligned subject of codecs. For some of you, this is going to be boring. For some of you, you're going to get really annoyed that I'm using acronyms and data rates. For other geeks out there, you are going to love this. So uh, I'll try and find a good balance. Codecs. Um, for years, Avid used um, Avid's codec, the OMF, the 14 to 1, 10 to 1, 1 to 1, et cetera. Um, over the past couple of years, that's not been able to be a reality in terms of being just using that codec. We now need to use other codecs that other camera manufacturers are using in their cameras. So um, Avid has introduced AMA back in version 3.5, which is Avid Media Access, which allows Media Composer to use codecs that you may not find natively within Media Composer. Those codecs, that list has grown exponentially, and over the past year or so, is now QuickTime-based, which means anything that you can double-click on your desktop, most likely you can use in Avid without importing.
Abbott has uh, expanded this in version 6 with the advent of ABCHD being native in the timeline. ABCHD is a, uh, getting to be a pretty popular consumer, prosumer HD codec. It's very compressed. It requires a very hefty system to use, but now you don't need to transcode it. You can use it natively inside Media Composer. We also have support for the Red Epic, and we also have uh, the new DNX HD 444 codec, which allows us to get 444 color space via RGB instead of uh, uh, what we were limited to before, which was 422. Uh, this is not an alpha channel. There is no alpha channel in this, so do not be confused with that. That brings our whole list of codecs to a staggering amount. As I mentioned, we have the Red and the QuickTime. We now uh, we still have the Canon 5D and 7D support. We have the ProRes AVC HD. Uh, going down the list, we still have XD Cam. We still have all the flavors of P2, including AVC Intra. We have the Ikigami GF Cam, and we also have MP3 and M4A. Um, <clears throat> one thing I want to clarify are codecs. Um, codecs, uh, I've had a lot of questions about um, in terms of what's what. Um, what's the difference between DNX HD and ProRes? Uh, differences are, are that DNX HD is all 8-bit unless there's an X next to the codec name, then it's 10-bit. ProRes is all 10-bit unless it's 4444, which is 12-bit. Um, DNX HD is a SMPTP standard, which means it's more open. Uh, Apple keeps their cards close to their chest, so ProRes gets leaked out, uh, so to speak, in a very limited fashion. Uh, ProRes is also VBR, variable bit rate, so it takes up less space um, than a constant bit rate DNX HD codec. DNX HD is also part of a family. Uh, the, the DNX HD family encompasses all frame rates, even if the number in the name doesn't correspond to the data rate. What does that mean? Well, let's say you're working in a 2398 project in Abbott, and you wanted to capture the lowest reds possible. That's going to be DNX 36. Well, let's say you now go to a, DNA, a uh, 2997 project. You will still be capturing into a DNX 36 family, but your data rate will be DNX 45 because you're running at 45 megabits a second. Is this important to know? No, but I don't want anyone out there to get confused. Why is that number off? Um, as long as you're in the ballpark, you're fine in terms of number. If 145 and 115, hey, those are pretty close. You should be OK. Um, there are plenty of places online where you can track down what the families are. Uh, my website has it, so um, feel free to uh, uh, ask me questions to try and explain that further. Where, where does the uh, analogy come in for codecs? Well, if you're used to ProRes Proxy, DNX 36 is going to be the way to go for you. Um, there is no exact uh, equivalent to DNX 145, uh, so you could go DNX, uh, or excuse me, ProRes LT, which is quality that's a little bit lower than 145, and ProRes 422, which is a little bit higher than 145. My good rule of thumb is DNX 145 is your baseline for broadcast quality, and ProRes 422 is your baseline for broadcast quality. Like the eagle on the right, haters going to hate. Um, those of us who tend to argue about codecs, and yes, there are some of us out there that do that, um, you're going to find that uh, uh, there's some debate on that. But I prefer to think DNX 145 and 422. DNX 220, which is 8-bit, and DNX 220X, which is 10-bit, uh, would be analogous to ProRes 422HQ. And then ProRes 444, which is new, is going to give you the highest quality possible in an AVID realm uh, that's not uncompressed, and that would be analogous to the ProRes 4444, but of course excluding alpha. And I hope I haven't bored you out there. Uh, quick little side box, uh, soapbox actually. I want everyone out there to be familiar with the concept of acquisition versus editorial. Um, acquisition codecs include XDCAM HD and EX, AVC Intra and HD, H.264 and RED. These are pretty pictures. The camera generates them and they look pretty. But if I can speak for camera manufacturers, and I'm sure they don't want me to, a majority of them don't care if you edit. Um, they are, they want to create pretty pictures and be done with it which means your editing system has to work overtime trying to get these codecs to look good and not break down. That's where editorial codecs come in. That's why we have ProRes and DNX HD. Those take up a lot more space but are a lot easier on the computer to chomp through and they hold up better uh, during uh, transcodes and effects. Um, so be aware that if you're trying to, to, why is my machine slow? 
hey, it may be because you're trying to use acquisition codecs. Uh, the exceptions, XDCAM and DVC Pro HD. Uh, these codecs have been around for several years, and I think CPUs are catching up to the point where um, they, they, a newer system is going to serve you really well with XDCAM. So I think you can use that as kind of a, a go-between, both an acquisition and editorial. DVC Pro HD, uh, it's kind of a news gathering codec. It's not full raster uh, when you get to 1080. Uh, so it may work for lower res stuff. I'm still not a fan of it for high end uh, post finishing. And of course, like I said, it's based on CPUs. A good rule of thumb is that camera codecs require more CPU but take up less space and vice versa. Another buzzword is long gap, avoid it. Hope all of you are still with me. Let's get into some of the other bigger features in Media Composer. And of course, if we're looking at Ralphie, we're looking talking about eyes, and of course, we're still talking about stereoscopic. This is my new film projector on the left-hand side. It came in last week. I uh, think you'll dig it. And one of the first films we're showing here at the local theater is Jaws 3D. Some of the features that we have in Media Composer 6. First off, uh, there aren't any other professional editing applications out there that understand 3D completely. Uh, Final Cut, you have to use uh, Cineform or uh, Tim Dashwood's plugin. Um, I don't want to hear anyone say Sony Vegas because they don't understand it well enough. Um, Avid is the only application out there that does it. And as much as I like to, to jump, on, uh, jump on Avid sometimes, they've really done it right with 3D in version 6. Some of the big features include full resolution of each eye, and this is why it's huge. In previous versions of Media Composer, you had to use a program called Metafuse, which was wonky, slow, on a PC, and quite frankly, a pain in the ass. Uh, it allowed you to um, take your left eye and right eye, squash down half the resolution into one eye, and then use that in Media Composer. So all your 3D footage was always going to be um, offline. You could never do full res each eye. You always had to do an offline and then reconform. Here's a quick little diagram. Don't need to read it, but as you can see, you're losing half your resolution depending on your, if you're doing a side by side or over under. The end game was loss of half your picture, which is of course bad. In Media Composer now, and we'll finally get back to Media Composer, you'll see that I have a left eye and right eye in this bin here. Sorry about that. Uh, you'll see that I have a left eye and right eye here. You may see the perspective changing uh, in your screen. I can, and these are both full res, by the way. I can right click, uh, and select both of these, and do a create stereoscopic clips. And you can either think of this as a grouped clip or, or a pointer, whatever help, helps you remember. This basically will cause a link or a wrapper without creating new media for these files. So I enter in my ancillary metadata on here, and you'll see that a new clip is generated, ocean waves. And you'll see when I screw through, screw, uh, scroll through here, you're probably thinking, well, so what, Michael? It looks like one clip to me. If I go down to my stereoscopic format setting and put this to side by side, you'll see that I instantaneously can see both eyes. This is Media Composer in real time sh uh, swashing the resolution so we can see it. If we had the appropriate hardware hooked up, I could have both eyes playing out simultaneously. Um, so this gives us the ability of doing a complete online of 3D within Media Composer without having to go to a third party application or doing an offline online. The other feature is we have content aware effects and titles. Um, sure, it's great to cut 3D, but if you can't add uh, text or effects to it, then what's the point? Um, here's an example of what we had to do before. If we did Metafuse and brought the clip into uh, Media Composer, Media Composer still thought it was a 2D clip. So if you put text over it, it would only be over, uh, it would put it over the entire image. Now, we have the ability of putting it on both eyes and Avid will automatically manage that. So let's jump into Media Composer again and take a look at that. So I have my, uh, I think I have a 3D sequence here. I'll load that up. And let's just uh, delete this clip. And we'll insert this clip in here. All right. So I want to get 3D text in here. Let's start with that. Uh, if I go into the Tools menu, I have my Title Tool application, which those of you who have been reading the documents know that Media Composer 6 now launches the Media Tool as a separate application. It launches within Media Composer, but it's a separate app. I'm going to say Title Tool, and 
There's my title tool, and I'm just going to put waves on here. And I'm going to do file, and we'll do save title. We'll call this waves, and we'll put this in my um, catch-all bin. It's creating the file. And when it pops in, I'm going to drop it on my timeline, and you're going to see exactly where. Uh, let's quit this. You'll see exactly where that pops up. There we go. I don't know if you can see there over the webinar, but I'll scroll in a little bit. You may see that the Waves is now put on both eyes. That's because MIDI Composer, again, understands this effect is 2D. Uh, this effect is on a 3D clip. I also have the ability now of going into my effects editor, and I can adjust almost any effect as well as any item, not only the stereoscopic properties, meaning apply it to both eyes or just one eye, but also adjust the vergence or the convergence. And if I adjust this, if you keep your eyes on the composer window, you'll see that the convergence is changing. So you can go to pleasurable to, nauseous, uh, to nauseous. And all this is keyframable as well. So that makes this a very powerful application, not only for editing, but for um, uh, your, your finished, uh, uh, to finish your, your, your film as well. As I mentioned, we have real-time uh, editing, we have mixed eye workflows, whichever one is dominant, left and right, as well as convergence adjustment, and then playout. So there really is a full feature set here of 3D. So uh, if those of you who have been waiting to, to dip your toe in the 3D pool because you didn't know what was available out there, you now should really be thinking about jumping into it. Of course, this has to be said, if you're going to cut 3D, you're going to need to decide whether you want to go active versus passive. Uh, you have to decide what kind of monitor you want, which is going to be active or passive, and then glasses to go along with that monitor. Uh, one thing that's often overlooked is storage space. Keep in mind that when you shoot stereo, you traditionally will have two eyes. Or if the file is heavily compressed, you may want to generate a new file from that, either in DNxHD or ProRes. So keep in mind that you're going to have a lot of extra storage needs when you're shooting stereo. Uh, a less expensive way is to go with a sanctioned NVIDIA 3D graphics card, and Media Composer can use the DVI or, or DisplayPort output of the video card to push a 3D monitor, which is a pretty cool portable solution. Next, we have our ears. We have audio. Uh, those of you who, uh, who sat in the Pro Tools webinar yesterday may have heard some of this, so I'm not going to go over it in depth. But there are a couple things which are uh, very important. First off is 5.1 and 7.1 support, which is pretty self-explanatory. This allows us to not only capture 5.1 and 7.1, which I showed in the capture tool, but we can also play backs around as well. Um, uh, this allows us to also create stereo tra or, uh, uh, surround tracks in your timeline. So if I go back to Media Composer and I say maybe I want a new audio track, I now have the ability of selecting a 5.1 or 7.1 track. And in my timeline, you'll see that I have now a listing here for 5.1. It now appears as any other track. And if I actually had a surround file and I played it on your VU meters here, you'd actually see all of them going. So you can monitor all of them at one point, at the same point, pardon me. We now have Dolby E plug-in support with our friend Thomas Dolby up here. Um, he's, uh, uh, with, the, with the Dolby E, uh, there's a little uh, confusion with that. This allows the Dolby E plug-in to be used within Media Composer. Um, does it allow you to encode and decode? No, but it allows the ability to use the plugin to encode and decode Dolby E. So that's, that's pretty cool for those of you who are bouncing back and forth between uh, your Pro Tools mixes and Media Composer, or just want to finish inside Media Composer. Pro Tools has some pretty cool uh, uh, add-ons as well. Those of you who have been using OMF and AAF for years to get video to and from uh, Pro Tools from Media Composer will now have the ability of doing real-time fades. Uh, Pro Tools 10 did away with the fades that you have to create and now does it on the fly. So the same way you created them in Media Composer is now translated to your timeline in Pro Tools. We now also have multi-channel audio export out of uh, Media Composer, again, 5.1 and 7.1, so that doesn't get lost in the translation. Uh, we have surround sound import of uh, digital files, as well as the clip-based gain automation, which allows for more seamless um, automation to transfer over from Media Composer to Pro Tools, as well as you can now import the rendered automation and effects you've done, again, in Media Composer to Pro Tools. This essentially will eliminate the time that the audio guy needs to, excuse me, audio person needs to do to recreate what was lost during the translation 
or just gives the audio guy another reason to dislike the uh, picture editors. Next, we have our gloves. Gloves mean touch. That's because about a year or so ago, Avid purchased a company called Euphonics. Again, you audio guys would pr are probably familiar with Euphonics. Uh, Euphonics has uh, um, uh, made control services for years, and uh, their control panels uh, follow the Yukon protocol, which is over Ethernet, sits on your network. And until recently, all of them have been supported uh, in Media Composer, including the MC Minix, MC Transport, MC Control, uh, which you can see right here. But until now, the MC Color was not supported. The MC Color brings professional, uh, semi-professional color grading ability within Media Composer. Instead of dragging your mouse along in the uh, in the um, color correction uh, window, you now have the ability of doing it with these trackballs. These trackballs are slightly weighted, so um, it, it's a lot smoother. Those of you who have done any kind of color grading uh, will find that this works really well. You also, of course, have the dynamic windows uh, menus up at the top, which is pretty cool. That being said, I think one of the control panels that's often overlooked is the uh, MC control. Uh, the MC control has kind of an MC mix hybrid versus MC tr uh, an MC transport hybrid, which allows you to work with faders, work with your transport, and have dynamic colored menus in the middle. So this makes it real easy uh, to navigate your session. Uh, it's kind of like an iPad on steroids. Some other minor things that have changed, but some of you may find this uh, interesting. Again, these can be found in the README, is a title tool which we went over. Those of you who uh, are moving projects between Mac and PC uh, now can use UNC paths, so relinking media is easy. As I'm doing now, uh, Symphony can be run in only software mode. Uh, in your relink menu uh, inside Media Composer, you now have the ability of uh, changing between tape and file-based media. Very handy with AMA and tape-based workflows. Um, when you save your project in Media Composer 6, you may realize that it saves a little bit slower. That's because the site settings are being written to XML. Not really sure what this means in the future for Avid, but the fact that Avid's adopting any kind of XML makes me happy. And those of you who are doing true progressive output may have uh, run into snags earlier via the HDMI output on some of the um, uh, Avid devices. Uh, now that's been rectified. So I have to go over necessary evil, and I'm going to blow through this because some of you it's going to bore, uh, but is your system going to work with the new version of Media Composer? That's a really good question. Um, first off, on a Mac, if you have a Mac Pro, it's got to be running Lion. No ifs, ands, or buts. Um, you can try installing it on Snow Leopard. I've seen it work. It runs like garbage. Don't do it. It needs to be 64-bit Lion. If you have Lion on your system, it should be default 64-bit. You should be golden. Uh, you have your 2.66 gigahertz Xeon processor. You need 4 gigs of RAM. Whoa, you need more. Trust me. Go 6, go 8, go 64 if you can. Get as much memory as possible because Media Composer is just going to use up more memory as it gets more mature. And uh, it's already dogging on my laptop, which is only a year old. Also, a sanctioned uh, uh, video card is always important. Good rule of thumb is that if your system was made after January 2008, most likely, Media Composer is going to run on it. So you don't need to go and look at code names like Westmere and Nehalem. If it's made after January 08, you should be golden. Uh, for Mac laptops, again, Lion, uh, you need a lot of RAM. Uh, I recommend upgrading to a 7200 RPM hard drive. That's always been the standard for playing back video, so upgrade it. Uh, MacBook Airs are now fully qualified, so the 13-inch with Thunderbolt will work great. Um, depending on how powerful your laptop is, your HD capture via a baseband source may be reduced. So be aware before you go out and buy a laptop or, or think you can capture HD, check the specs to make sure it works. Anything after June 2007, you should be okay. And an iMac, again, there are the specs, add more RAM. Anything after March 2009, you should be okay to run Media Composer 6. On a PC side, we'll go through the same drill. You need Windows 7. You need a lot of RAM, again. Uh, those of you who are accustomed to the sanctioned uh, qualified systems, the HP and the Dells, uh, if you have a machine that's a 4600 or above or a T34 or above, Media Composer 6 will run on it. Anything after mid-2009, you should be good. Again, computer manufacturers, Dell and HP come out at different dates, so you know there's a little bit of play within 2009 as to what machine will work. 
On a laptop, same requirements, Windows 7 Professional 64-bit. Uh, if you're doing an HP, it's going to be an EliteBook 8530 or a Dell 6400. The 67200 RPM drive is always recommended. And again, late 2008 is going to be the way to go. Miscellaneous, again, HD capture. Is your system uh, powerful enough to capture it? That we'll have to determine on a uh, system by system basis. If you're buying a tower, there's slot configs. How many cards can you fit in your system? Be aware that if you build your system, to check this out and have its website. Um, will your video card have GPU acceleration? A dirty little secret on the Mac side is that Macs don't support GPU acceleration inside Media Composer. Yes, Avid cannot use GPU acceleration on a Mac, unfortunately. This is because of a bug in the uh, Mac driver, unfortunately. No way around it. And then support. If you build your own system, support's obviously going to be limited. If you buy it from Dell or HP, you get an outstanding warranty. All the specs on what systems are qualified are on Avid's website, so please scribble this down or just go to avid.com, click on products, go to Media Composer, and there's a tab for requirements. Things that are end of life, I'm sorry to end on a bad note, but 32-bit OS, this will not work on a 32-bit OS, end of story, don't try it. The Adrenaline, yes, the Adrenaline has been retired. That is no longer supported with Media Composer 6. The Nitrous Classic, that's no longer supported, nor is the Mojo SDI. They've all had good shelf lives, but unfortunately it's time to move on. Those of you who are using Unity, uh, port server-based Ethernet clients, that's not supported in Media Composer 6. And I hate to say it, but the Analog Mojo and Meridian are still um, not supported. Here are some prices for you. Uh, I'm not going to go over all of them. Uh, a few key ones you should know is that Media Composer 6 is still $2,500, still a decent price. Symphony Software standalone has dropped in price to six grand. Uh, you can upgrade rather inexpensively from five five to six via download for 300 bucks. It's 500 if you want to get a box kit. A box kit is uh, a hardware box from Avid, physical hardware or physical software that comes with uh, third-party applications. Uh, those third-party applications vary depending on if you have Mac or PC. So uh, feel free to give me a call and we'll talk about what apps come with what system so we can go from there. Um, you can also upgrade to pre-55 to 6 for a few hundred dollars more, which is 600 bucks. Media, uh, Final Cut uh, Crossgrade is 1500 bucks. So any version of Final Cut from version 1 to 7, you get to keep Final Cut as long as you give Avid your serial number, you now can uh, upgrade or to media or get a version of Media Composer 6 for 1500 bucks. Uh, then Educational is uh, 300 bucks, which is four years of free upgrades, which is just fantastic. And then of course, all the hardware from Avid has been basically cut in half in terms of pricing, and so some of that may be more attractive than compromising and going with a third party I.O. This is me. Uh, I'm the one who's been talking for the past hour. And you can certainly track me down either at keycodemedia.com. You can track me down at my website where I uh, pontificate and wax geek philosophic. Or track me down on Facebook or Twitter. I think we have time for a few questions. So without uh, any more ado, I'll turn this over to Matt. And Matt, tell us where to go. Thank you, Sheriff Michael Thomas. <laughs> uh, the first question we have comes from Mark. And he says, we're thinking of moving away from Final Cut Pro and going with Avid Media Composer 6. How well will, will our collection of ProRes assets work with Media Composer 6? That's a fantastic question, and not to throw out my website, but there's a concept in Avid called Fast Import. Uh, fast Import allows that anyone with dnxhd.mov media, uh, so with the dnxhd codec .mov, if you tell Avid to import that, Avid is going to see it and say, hey, I recognize what you are, I smell my own, I'm going to import you, but not transcode you, I'm just going to link to you, rewrap you, and put you in my folder. That's anywhere from 50 to 80% uh, quicker. The same is true with ProRes, meaning if I have a ProRes file, um, I can tell Avid, to link or to import a ProRes file, and it's going to say, hey, I understand what you are. I understand ProRes natively. And it's going to allow you to import, but in this, in this case, just rewrap, no new transcode, and put that in the Avid Media Files folder. It creates a copy of your ProRes media. Uh, what does that mean for you? That means now you have the metadata management of um, Avid but you get the media that you used with Pro Tool or with Final Cut. So this is a great way to migrate your data, your media, from uh, uh, Final Cut 
to Abbott. So I think it's a great thing for you to do. All right. Thank you, Mark. Uh, the next question is, uh, we actually got a lot of questions, and it was in regards to whether this webinar is being recorded. The answer is yes. Uh, we'll have it posted on our website later next week. Uh, the same however, however, there are royalties, so be aware that you know I expect a little kickback. This is correct. <laughs> <laughs> totally joking, totally joking. All right. Uh, next question comes from Dan. What? It's the easiest way uh, in Codex to compress and export a finished sequence to email clients. I think you answered this earlier, but just wanted to go over it again. That's, that's really tricky because then we get down to the concept of deliverables, and deliverables are, are at the behest of what the end user wants. <clears throat> Traditionally, this is either in file size, so your best bet is to reverse engineer. Mr. Client, how big of a file can I send you? and then work backwards from there. Um, H.264 is a, is a broad recommendation. However, H.264 is kind of like saying, oh, I want an MPEG, uh, because there are several flavors of H.264. So it's asking the client, what would you like? How big of a file size can uh, you handle? And then try and use an H.264 um, at a lower data rate until it looks good to you. Great. There's a question from Krista, um, and I think I'll be able to answer this question. It says, do these third-party companies, um, I guess in regards to the cards, offer student prices? Um, it varies per vendor, and if you need information, more information on that, you can email sales at keycodemedia.com. We have an education uh, sales specialist here at Keycode. I'm not going to let you do the webinar because you got it. The next question is from Josh. Are frame conversions possible with OpenIO? How about DNX HD 444? Uh, there are frame conversions possible. Uh, if you mean frame conversions, meaning can you do cross convert on the way out, if that's what you're uh, referring to, I can certainly go into my format tab and do uh, um, uh, change my project type and do a cross convert on the output. Depending on the I/O, um, that will autom uh, determine what you can cross convert on the way out. For example, the um, AJA has a lot of cross conversion built on the card. Um, so it's going to be dependent on the I.O. manufacturer and what they've been able to code for. So it's kind of hard to answer that in a blanket statement. All right. Um, there's a question from Timothy. Uh, if I don't plan to create 3D, do I need Media Composer 6? He's using uh, 5.0 right now. Sure, sure. Well, 6.0 is obvious, or uh, 3D is, is obviously a huge part of 6. Um, do you need 6 if you're not doing 3D? No, but I'd, I'd counter that with, well, how many random pieces of media are you getting from your clients? Um, how many random uh, codecs are you getting? And 5.5 and 6.0 only increase the ability of Media Composer to do that. If you're used to playing in your own sandbox, you shoot one format, you edit in one codec, you output in one codec, and you've got your own workflow ironed out, hey, yeah, there's no reason to upgrade. But if you're trying to stay current, um, I think that 6.0 is, is worth the couple hundred dollar upgrade. All right, thank you, Michael. Is there any more questions? Uh, this question comes from George. How Hi, George. do you like the interop changes between MC and uh, Media Composer and Pro Tools moving out makers from locators? Uh, I, I think it's going to be difficult for um, Avid editors to make that change because now we're talking about nomenclature changes. Um, Avid has decided to go with the unified naming convention between Pro Tools and Avid, which I think is, quite frankly, 20 years too late. You know, For those of you who don't know, Avid owns Pro Tools, and it's taken them uh, several years to get things to, to, to play well together. Um, I like it. Um, as a former audio editor, obviously I get a little sad because that means uh, more audio features are being wrote in, written into Avid, which means less work for my audio brethren. Um, but I like the interop, and I think hopefully this will cause people to get off OMF finally and move to AAF. So, so I like the interop. Okay, great. Looks like we have one more question, and I, I guess we can take maybe one or two more. I'm your, I got time. In your opinion, do you think that with Final Cut Pro 10 being rejected by most professionals, will Avid 6 be the dominant NLE in the near future? Uh, that's a really tough question. I mean, I'm based here in Hollywood, which means that I work in a microcosm that is unlike anywhere else in the world. Avid is still dominant in um,
Uh, Avid is, sorry about that. Um, Avid is still the dominant feature player in um, Hollywood feature film. I think it's still the dominant editorial device for long form. Um, do I think this is a great opportunity for Avid to capitalize on Final Cut refugees? Yes. Do I think Apple's going to get their crap together and, and enable the features that we need in Final Cut 10? And so when new editors come up in a couple of years, they'll rediscover that? Yes. So I think Avid has a very finite window to recapture some of the market share they have lost over the past decade. All right. Well, thank you so much, Michael. I think that's our final question for today. Again, if you missed the beginning of the webinar, we do have another session going on at 1 p.m., and you can register on our website. Uh, thank you very much for attending. Have a good day.